Hi. Hello, hello and welcome to the Science Slam as part of the Global Forum for Food and Agriculture here at the Grüne Woche. Uh, my name is Drew Portnoy. I will be the moderator of the Slam and I'm glad to be here because today we'll be talking about my second favorite topic, food. Um, I'm lying, it's my first favorite topic as you can see. Uh, so anyway, I'll tell you a little bit more about the Slam and, about, and I'll introduce you to our Slammers today, but before we get started at Slams, we always like to talk a little bit about what's going on in science at the moment, and it's a very exciting time in science, actually. Uh, I know this because I have to look up science stories for every slam I host, and a lot of time there's not much happening. But right now there's a lot going on. For example, uh, in January, this is the 20th anniversary of the Spirit and Opportunity rovers landing on Mars, uh, which is kind of hard to believe. It seems to me like Spirit and Opportunity landed yesterday, but they've been there up on Mars for 20 years. And of course, they were supposed to have a 90-day mission, uh, but Opportunity lasted 15 years. And we learned a lot from Spirit and Opportunity. We learned that Mars was actually once covered with a lot of water. And in fact, there was probably life in that water. Uh, the one thing that Spirit and Opportunity did not discover was Matt Damon farming potatoes on Mars. Uh, so it's, it's also, it's the 20th anniversary of Spirit and Opportunity. It's also the 10th anniversary of that joke, uh, because I think every time people talk about Spirit and Opportunity, they make a Matt Damon joke. Uh, the interesting thing, though, that they do think now is that Matt Damon did not have to make his own water. A lot of the water that was once on Mars, at least 30% is still on Mars. It absorbed into the rocks and the other minerals that were there. It could be as much as 90%. The previous theory was that the water all went out into the atmosphere, but now they think actually a lot of the water is still there. So if Matt does make it to Mars next time, he does not have to make his own water. Uh, the other interesting thing actually has to do with food. Uh, they've been looking at woolly mammoths in, uh, up in Alaska from my home country in America. Uh, they've been looking at woolly mammoths because they find the tusks and they can look at the isotopes in the tusks and figure out what the woolly mammoths were eating and where they were walking. And that's important because it's a little unclear of why the woolly, woolly mammoths went extinct. But by looking at the isotopes in their tusks, they now think that what happened was after the last ice age ended, the climate changed and the grasslands that the woolly mammoths depended on became forests and they could no longer eat as much. And the other problem was we people could hide better in the forest and hunt the mammoths better. That's what they think happened was we contributed to their extinction. And the, the last mammoth they looked at, her name was Elma. She actually had a much longer Inuit name, but I can't say it, so they called her Elma. She lived 4,000 years ago. And uh, she followed the same path for her. She went up and down 1,000 kilometers, the same 1,000 kilometers her whole life. And they discovered that mammoths before her went up the same 1,000 kilometers. And actually, us people followed them. We were nomads, and we just followed where the mammoths were because we ate them as food. And uh, Elma was also, they believe, food because they found her remains in a hunting camp. So those people, so Elma, they found her in this camp, so she was apparently food. She died at 20, but I think she was either food or she was a pet. Maybe she was a pet. I'm gonna go with pet because I like that story better. But of course, I'm not a scientist. Okay, I think that's enough about the science these days. I think maybe uh, it would be time to start the slam. And as part of beginning the slam, I would like to uh, welcome uh, Maya Clausen from Research and Innovation at the German Ministry for Food and Agriculture to tell us a little bit about the slam. Hello, good afternoon, a warm welcome also from my side and from the Federal Ministry of Food of, of, and Agriculture, who is sort of hosting this whole um, yeah, hall. And um, I think, yeah, most of you who have been around uh, the Green Week, but also as part of the Global Forum for Food of, and Agriculture, science and research play a major role in yeah, solving the challenges and the problems that we are facing when it comes to food systems globally, but also yeah, locally and where we all live. We all eat and we all are part of the system. And I think it's also something that we are all keen to find out more about, well, how can we solve the problems and feed not only ourselves, but also yeah, people in other countries of the world. It makes sense for me why you're having a science slam here because I host science slams all over Germany and actually all over the world. But I'm curious why uh, the Ministry for Food and Agriculture decided to have a science slam. Yes, as I said before, um, research and science play a crucial role in the agriculture and food sector. Not all people are so much aware of it and also don't necessarily know that science can be very entertaining. And we felt that uh, looking at the Global Forum for Food and Agriculture, which happens uh, in parallel to the Green Week, that we would like to connect the international debate with what's happening um, yeah, in the BMEL Hall here at the Green Week, because it's all connected. 
But you actually have a personal history with slams. You, you were the one that brought the slams to the GFFA? Well, I think um, I was very enthusiastic when I witnessed the first sign slam, what actually um, I witnessed it in 2013 here in Berlin, because I was part of a team that um, co-hosted the German South African Year of Science, and uh, the sign slam is a, actually a German invention, because it comes from poetry slams, and it's become very popular in the German university landscape, but in the meantime, yeah, it's been become international, and it's great to see yeah, a mixed audience here, and I'm looking forward to more science enthusiasm. Okay, Frau Klaus, and vielen Dank. Thank Have you very much. Have fun and enjoy. Good yeah, luck to thanks. you. Okay. All right. Before I explain the rules of our science slam and how it will work, I would like to introduce you to our slammers today. So I would like to bring them all up on stage. Uh, if you, so if you could please welcome uh, our first slammer will be Atika Saleh from Singapore and Dresden. And then Christopher Okolo from Nigeria and Bonn. <laughs> then Ivana Gaidorova from Bulgaria. And finally, Jorge, Jorge Guadalupe from Brazil. <laughs> I hope I did not damage their names too much. Uh, <laughs> these are our four slammers today. You'll get to know them a lot more in a minute. Thanks a lot, guys. You can yeah, have a seat you. again. Thanks. <laughs> Give them another round of applause. All right, so now let me explain what a slam is. It is a competition, uh, so if we're gonna have a competition, we need to have rules. We also need to have rules because we're in Germany, so uh, let's, it's not just the competition. We're in Germany, we need some rules, but we only have four rules for science slams. The first rule is that the slammers can only present their own research. They can only talk about what they know about and what they've looked at themselves. It has to be from their own brains. The second rule is uh, it needs to be understandable. That's a big problem in science is that the scientists get so involved in their research and their ideas that they aren't able to project it outwards and let us know what exactly they're talking about. So the slammers today need to be understandable. Third, it needs to be entertaining. That's the whole point of a slam is we're here, we wanna learn and we also wanna have a good time. So it needs to be entertaining. I've met all four of them. I don't think it's gonna be a problem. Uh, and the final most important thing is they have to do all of that in just 10 minutes. We need to do it within 10 minutes. And because of that, I would like to ask a volunteer who could be a timekeeper. If somebody has their phone all charged up and would be willing to volunteer, we can probably get you a free drink after the show. So I'm like, all right, he's, he's your volunteer. Your phone's charged up? What's your name? Saeed. Saeed. Sorry, can we get a round of applause for Saeed, the timekeeper? All right. Okay, Said, what I need you to do is at eight minutes, you need to give a little warning ring so that the slammers know they need to wrap it up. What would a warning ring sound like? If you... A little bit easier, just a little. There you go, perfect. And then at 10 minutes, when they need to know it's over, there you go, perfect, all right. Please, another round of applause for Said. Why not? We're just doing applause today. Okay. So now I told you all the rules because in the end, you will be picking the winner. The audience picks the winner. Uh, we're gonna do it with some technology. I will explain that at the end of the slam, how you pick the winner. But just remember, keep those four rules in mind so, because you're gonna have to vote in the end and that's very important. Okay, I think I've got the rules. I introduced me, I introduced the slammers. Then I think uh, we can pretty much start the slam. But the one, one thing that's important is we need energy and we need support from you guys for the slammers because they put a lot of effort into their presentations. Uh, they've flown a long way, some of them, to come here. And so part of the, their reward is your applause. And so I just want to make sure that everybody's got the energy that our slammers deserve. And uh, so usually what we used to do at this point was we did play these little applause games. They were, they, were, they were embarrassing for me. They were embarrassing for you guys. They were embarrassing for Saeed the timekeeper. And that's so, today I won't do the little applause games. I'm just gonna ask you to give one big applause to show me that you've got the energy and the support that's worth for our slammers. So in a second, I'm gonna count to three and I just want you to maybe applause, maybe stomp on the floor a little bit, maybe you know a little scream a little bit, a little cry or not, whatever, you know, just sort of, not quite rock star, but almost rock star. That's kind of the level we're going for uh, this. Uh, and uh, please put a lot of effort in this because if you don't do this, then we're gonna go do the applause games and that's all we're doing today. I'm gonna send the slammers home and we'll just do applause warm. So put some effort in this, okay? Are you guys ready? One, two, three. Ah. All right. Okay, I think we're set. That's good. That was a nice touch, Said. I like I like your style as a timekeeper. That's uh, 
Nice. All right, then um, I think we're ready to start the slam. I think we should get it going. Then uh, please uh, welcome our first uh, slammer of the day, Atika Saleh. You go. Yeah. Uh, so you actually have lived in a lot of different places in Germany. Where all have you lived? Well, I, my journey in Germany actually started in Stuttgart. Uh, it was actually the first European city as well that I've been, or yeah, to and lived in. Um, and then Heidelberg, Bremen, München, kind of a Kreis, and then Berlin. And um, I've been in Dresden for the past uh, almost eight years. Well, then the natural question is, what's your favorite German city? Do we really have to do this? <laughs> We're all, look at them, they're all wondering. They're all asking. It's Berlin. <laughs> you already won, you guys can go home. <laughs> it's super, but how do you like Dresden? Um, Attica, sorry. What? Sorry. Could how, you... What do you, well, how do you like Dresden? Dresden? Where do I start? <laughs> Uh, all right. Well, how, how did you find your topic that you're going to talk about today? Because you're actually a community, you were into communications. I was indeed. So I haven't always been in research. Uh, I started my uh, doctoral research about a year and a half uh, ago. And uh, I had always been curious. So I'd always worked with academics. And, um, you know, there was always this uh, tango between science and uh, communication. And uh, I was always curious to find out as well what the challenges are for researchers to communicate their science. And I thought I would learn by doing and uh, actually cross over and also do it myself. And yeah, here I am, I guess. It's <laughs> a perfect match for <laughs> Science Slam, science communications. And finally, you went to your first uh, United Nations COP climate, con climate conference. And you made uh, an interesting, you, uh, you, have an, you, you made an interesting discovery, which of how people get to the climate conferences. Yeah, well, I guess it's also quite a well-known irony that, you know, we really all mostly flew over from all over the world, right? Uh, and uh, indeed, it was rather strange that all of us are coming to, yeah, obviously a huge petrol state <laughs> as well. But I think it was a necessary step to kind of just bring everyone. I mean, of course, it's arguable, it's been 28 years for us to get to where we are, and that's far too long, but uh, it could have been 28 more, so okay, it's a start. All right, well, um, I think we're ready to start. Are you? I Said, guess. are you ready? All right, then I would say uh, start the timer and let's go have fun. Thank you. Well, hello again, Berlin. Today, I'm happy to invite you to a journey into a future where cities not only shelter us, but also nurture us with fresh produce. What am I talking about? Before we journey together, who here has heard of vertical farming? I think that's a lot of you, or zero acreage farming. Maybe you can also already guess from its name. And uh, I think if you've also made a round here, you might have also seen some examples. Great to see quite a lot of hands, actually. And for those new to it, I will walk you through it in the context of our food challenges. So climate change, coupled with the looming water shortage, demands a radical shift in how we produce our food. At the same time, our insatiable appetite has led to the depletion of natural resources, putting immense strain on ecosystems and biodiversity. With the global population steadily increasing and more of us flocking to cities, the demand for food rises. Now, urbanization, while some argue is a symbol of progress, intensifies the strain on our agricultural land. Consumers seek food, especially perishables such as vegetables that are not only safe and healthy, but also tasty, sustainable, and locally sourced. Walk into a Rewe supermarket and you see it proudly written, regional. Now, recent global shocks as well, such as the pandemic, conflicts, and wars, have exposed the fragility of our interconnected systems, including, and I would argue, especially food supply chains. 
And just last week, The Economist reported that the next global pandemic could be a planned pandemic. This is a compelling call for resilient food security solutions. Now imagine a world where the skylines of our cities not only define our landscapes, but also sustain us. This is one vision of tomorrow's foodscapes. So how are we going to achieve it? Vertical farming? There is no one definition of various types of vertical farming, uh, but these large-scale vertical farms might be what people uh, intuitively think of, and some of them are also known as plant factories with multiple layers or vertical walls, maximizing the use of space, enabling higher yields per square meter uh, compared to traditional horizontal uh, farming. So often indoor, and some would argue that it's exclusively indoor, uh, vertical farms allow then precise control over things like light, humidity, temperature, um, nutrients, etc. So in Singapore, uh, where I come from, with the falling birth rate and schools shutting down, what do we do with this unused school hall? We grow strawberries instead. Now, who would have thought that one of the best strawberries I've ever tasted might actually come from the tropics? Uh, so it's actually white when ripe, yeah. Now, scaling down neighborhood farms bring agriculture closer to home. Now, vertical farms in urban areas reduce the carbon footprint associated with transport of food miles. We've identified the rooftops of uh, multi-story car parks as sites for our urban farming. So they're usually unused, it's too hot, um, except maybe my dad who likes to park his car where he can see it from the flat. Now, in Dresden, we seek to bring vertical farms to as many locations in the city as possible. So it's not always bad. <laughs> With these tower farms, water gets recirculated by a pump for some minutes each hour. So the plants use at least 40% and up to 90% less water in a closed-loop system through aeroponics. For those who are familiar with the Solidarische Landwirtschaft, or Zolavi concept in uh, Germany, it's something like that, aber anders. Now, container farms provide the flexibility to establish tiny farms virtually anywhere. So in Dubai, when I was at COP, uh, this container farm basically sheds light on vertical farming to residents on uh, living at the sustainable city. This one in Vienna looks humble, but ambitiously introduces, introduces mushrooms as an alternative protein to the Austrian diet. I took home a growing kit, and here I was super proud of harvesting uh, my own oyster mushrooms that were fed just coffee grounds. In Lisbon, this container farm produces exotic herbs for high-end restaurants in the city. So the possibilities are virtually endless. Now imagine walking through the aisles of a supermarket and encountering not just shelves of produce in ridiculous plastic packaging, but a farm within the store. Supermarket farms would, if you think about it, ensure unparalleled freshness. So this setup is an, uh, is an, or was in an Edeka supermarket in Berlin. I got a little curious this morning um, and headed down to Steglitz, where this Edeka supermarket was. Update, it's not there anymore. Many vertical co uh, farm companies, including uh, the one behind this one, are seriously going bust. Now this brings me to the next point. Besides maybe looking fancy, vertical farming does offer resource use efficiency, right? So less water, less land, um, less fertilizer, no pesticides, year-round localized production, independent of weather and climate and seasons. But its sustainability is almost always questioned when it comes to energy consumption. Good news, it's an ever-growing field of research, part of which my colleague and I at the UN University in Dresden are working on. On the one hand, systems such as hydroponics, aeroponics, and aquaponics with fish, so this is um, a vertical farm in uh, Singapore, 
coupled with photovoltaics, IoT, automation, and more, could contribute to continuous advancements in sustainable farming practices. On the other hand, the vertical farming hype seems to be over. Several vertical farming companies are really disappearing. Now, when I was last home, I found a website of a super fancy vertical farm that I really wanted to see myself. Uh, but when I got there, it just didn't exist anymore. Well, not this. This is our airport. <laughs> so my research delves into this complex landscape, exploring the factors that influence the acceptance of vertical farming for a whole of society approach. Understanding what drives societal acceptance of different stakeholders from consumers to residents to urban planners help us design optimal policies and interventions to realize so-called edible cities or as Barstetter. We normally talk about consumers like <clears throat> you and I, but what if I told you about prosumers, individuals who actively engage in food production within their built environment? Imagine a society where we take agency in growing our food and redefine our relationship with food. Let's examine this together. How many of you would participate in a vertical farm? And what would you like to grow? Parsley. Parsley. <laughs> Tomatoes, right. So virtually, in theory, you could grow anything, right? So the controlled environment's great for leafy and, herb, uh, and herbs, especially leafy greens and herbs, especially, but also high-value crops like tomatoes. And who here has smoked weed before? Just kidding, don't raise your hands. But high-value crops as well as medicinal uh, plants like cannabis and crops for pharmaceuticals and cosmetics are particularly interesting for vertical farming. It's really encouraging to see some interest among you and even more motivating to carry on my research per pursuit. Now, my challenge for us is imagine a future where every balcony, every rooftop contributes to our sustenance, where the urban fabric isn't just concrete, but also a fertile ground for nourishment. Thank you. Herzlichen Dank for your part in envisioning a sustainable good future. Hey. Thanks, Atika. It's all good. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Don't forget the clicker. Yes. Cool. That's it? Yeah. Cool. All right. Uh, I think my Edeka has a vertical farm in it too. I'm gonna have to check if it's still there. Then please welcome our next slammer, Christopher Okolo from Nigeria. Oh. Oh. Uh, am I saying your last name right? Again. Okay, I forgot to ask you how to pronounce it. So you live in Bonn. I live in Bonn. People, because Berlin and Bonn, we have a sort of a rivalry. How do you like Bonn? I love Bonn, but it's okay that you took the capital away from Bonn to Berlin. By the way, Berlin is beautiful. This is my favorite city, but it's spelled with the letter B O double N. Um, I love Bonn. Um, I love that you left the relics of the United Nations, the Deutsche Post, which really makes the beautiful uh, city. So I love Bonn. Uh, and, uh, it's a nice city. Okay. Yeah. Uh, um, and uh, how's your German? Ich verstehe ein bisschen Deutsch. Not so well, but I'm trying. Okay. I'm trying. The next time we meet, we'll communicate in German. I promise you. I'm joking. I was good <laughs> All right. I forgot to ask Atika, but I'll ask you, what's your favorite German word? That's interesting. Hmm. The first German word I ever heard is the word, get ready, Schmetterling. And it's, it's, it's funny because I work with worms, and those worms grow to become moth or butterflies. So that's the connection, Schmetterling. Let's bought a fly. It's a nice word. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, I think we're ready. Said, are you ready? All right. You ready? You I clicker? think so. All right. Then let's start the time. Please give applause and have fun. <clears throat> Hi, folks. I want to talk to you about one of the biggest battles that never made it to the public arena. 
and that is the battle of the box. Only for a little squeaky worm to come up and save the day. Think about who? Okay. I'm having battle with this. It's a protest. Now we are back. Think about an enemy getting on your battlefield, destroying everything, and then stands out as undefeated. And then an emperor comes in with his merchandise and destroys the enemy. But before we get ahead of ourselves, I would like to take you to the beginning, when we have relative peace, all is green, no trouble, and we're all living in harmony. Little did we know that little guys were under beneath trying to cause some havoc, spreading around rumors of something that we never knew about. And in their wake, they left the city destroyed. And in panic, the people decided to spray the old, outdated style of conquering the enemies. However, it doesn't really work because they left the city shattered. Waters polluted, the air completely destroyed, and humans dying because we're trying to destroy the enemies. Then something happened. The city mayor got in touch with me and said, Guy, we have a problem. What are our options? And I say, well, you could use some tiny guys called bacteria, or another variant called viruses, or the old-fashioned birds. But my favorite is a squiggle worm called entomopathogenic nematodes. Could you try it out, please? Entomopathogenic. I know it's a mouthful, but I'll break it down for you. Entomo comes from the root word of insect entomology. Pathogenic means disease causing, and uh, nematodes are your roundworms. And if you are a biologist, your first contact with nematodes might be those little guys under the soil destroying the plants. Those are the bad guys. I am not a bad guy. I have nothing to do with bad guys. I chose to focus on the good guys, and these are the entomopathogenic nematodes. They have this brilliant ability to cause diseases to insects that would rather destroy your cities, the enemies. Just to give you an insight what they actually do. So they get into the insect, the enemy, release their arsenals and ammunitions, and the enemy is dead. Sweet and simple. Or as in German, cross und schmettlos. So easy just to give you more insight of what happens. So when it gets into the insects, either through any of the orifices, the mouth, the anal region, or just brutally going through the skin, it clears off any defense mechanism of the enemies and releases the toxins. Those toxins kills the enemy in less than two days. And then we have relative peace. Now, there was a problem. There was a new enemy who seems to defy what they had available. And my team got an intel that there is a new strain of this nematode way back in Nigeria. And I thought, why not? So we went back to Nigeria. We got some packs of this fixed into some brown stuff. We couldn't see those nematodes. Then we brought them and then tried to get them out. And this is where the story gets interesting. So we nicely asked this little nematodes to get out, and we had some manuals on how to do that. And then they decided to, well, let's put them in a box, which could easily get them out sweetly, because we really had to be nice to them. 
And then finally, we got them out, apply them on these enemies, and get set. Is anyone having lunch here? No, it's about to get messy. In the wake, they destroy the enemies, and you have the enemies as a pop of soup, a terrible soup. Now, the whole idea here is, once this ammunition, the nematodes, get into the battlefield, it cuts the life cycle of this enemies, the worm. So that next generation, they would not be able to multiply and cause havoc. Because we want to protect the next generation. So as you can see there, once they cause the havoc, we can't do anything about it anymore. But they cannot destroy our children or our grandchildren because they are so nice. And this is how the nematode won the battle, the battle of the box. The whole idea of this presentation is to call your attention of alternative ways to control insects instead of the old-fashioned chemicals which are not exactly sustainable. And all in the aim to have several options in the integrated pest management and ultimately get zero hunger. As you can imagine, this was tough. But with a slight change in perspective, we won the victory and everyone was smiling. Now, I don't want to claim that I did this all, my, all, all by myself. Um, I had supports. Apparently, there were people who had some interest in this. Uh, so they send in their funds, they send in their supports. And these are all the, the, the people who, who came up to support this mission to destroy the enemies. And um, just in case you have some problems with some enemies, please get in touch with me, and I will send my ammunition to come destroy them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christoph. Thank you. Have a seat. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Yeah. I need to get some nematodes for my garden next year, I think. Yeah, so they stop eating my lettuce. All right, our third slammer of the day, I'd like to welcome Ivana Gaidarova. How to Harvest Health. Uh, all right. Um, it's fine, you can stand there. Uh, uh, so you also have a connection to Germany. This is not your first time here. You've actually lived here before. Yes, indeed. I studied in Gießen for two semesters, and then I also had a little bit of practice there. So I did spend quite a while time in Germany. How's your German? Um, not so good, not so bad. I mean, it's, it's all right. It's good. <laughs> And what, what did you do in Gießen? You, what were you studying? Yeah, I'm studying veterinary medicine, so I continued my education there in the faculty. And you also did something else in Gießen. You have a very interesting hobby. <laughs> yes, that's right. Um, I'm also a basketball player, and I played for the local team there, Wiesek. And uh, we actually was in the second place in the Regionalliga, and I'm quite happy and you, <laughs> about that. <yeah. laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and did you, have you played basketball in Bulgaria then? Yes, there I've been playing uh, very actively since um, eight years old. <laughs> and have you won any championships there? Uh, the, the national one a few times, but uh, that was uh, when I was younger. <laughs> okay, all right. And then the other question, what's your favorite German word? My favorite German word, oh yeah, it's not uh, that uh, soundly like uh, Schmetterling. Uh, for me, I would say quasi. That is quasi my Lieblingswort. <laughs> yeah. I think that's... Yeah, that's a nice word. All right. Well, I think we've chatted enough. Uh, Said, oh. are you ready? All right, then uh, 10 minutes. Uh, have fun. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so hello, everybody. Before we dwell deep into my presentation, I would just like to ask how many of you have any pets, like cats, dogs, or farm animals? <laughs> All right, there are quite some people. <laughs> this is great to see. You will receive some important tips here. And for the people who don't have any pets, do not worry, because this presentation will still be beneficial for you. You will see that from the next slide. Now, I'm talking about uh, important zoonotic diseases that are actually two bacteria and one that is a virus. 
What they have in common is that they can be passed from animals to humans. Um, this is quite an important topic because right now there are many new emerging diseases of this kind and we still haven't gotten rid of the old ones that have been circulating for a while now. So for this reason I chose this topic for research and I would like to show you now uh, a little bit more about how to keep our animals and ourselves healthy and also how to fight off those type of organisms. So now comes the tricky part. I think that you might have seen those type of cars before or you have been seeing them right now. All right, that's great. This is the back side of them and uh, they are like a cartoon made by me. Sorry for it, it looks a little bit silly. And then the other part is actually the front which has a title, the disease, and a little bit of information about it. So maybe some of you don't really have, but if you could have like a partner with you to look them, it would be also good. <laughs> so these cards come into play because maybe at the end of each disease description, it would be nice to find them both together in a Sherlock Holmes type of manner. So I'm not going to show you the diseases right away and I'm not going to tell you about which one is which. So you're going to find them out by yourself. And uh, be mindful that there is a fourth card that is uh, another disease that I'm not talking about in this presentation. It is also part of the scientific paper. So feel free to ask me about it afterwards, but not right now because the time is ticking and um, it's a little bit stressful. <laughs> okay, so without any further ado, let's go to the first disease. So the first disease is actually a bacterial infection and it goes by many names. I would personally like to call it the rabbit's revenge because it is mostly found in the rodents. But it can also affect large animals like farm animals and horses as well and also our beloved cats and dogs too. So this is a bit uh, tricky because this organism is very resilient and it can survive in many places like in the water, in the meat as well, in the mud, grass and on the fur of the animals too. So now you're gonna ask, okay Ivana, but why are you telling us all of this? Like, uh, what are the symptoms like? That was what is going to happen. Well, the symptoms are quite unpleasant and you can see here the skin lesions that are happening. They are also accompanied by fever, chills, and just not very interesting and nice to experience things. So don't worry though, it's uh, very easy to cure. So now I'm going to tell you more about the, the disease cures and how to treat it, but before that let's rewind. So the criminal is a bacteria, as we mentioned. The victims are animals, but they can also be humans. They can be farmers, veterinarians, other farm workers or even lab workers because they also work with rodents all the time. So, we haven't seen the crime scenes, let's take a look. Now that's a dog that's shaking. I'm pretty sure everyone who had a dog has been in this situation before. Well, I'm sorry to tell you but once uh, there was a case of a dog that shook himself and it got seven people around him sick of this disease. The second piling hay, I'm, not, I'm sure it's not really interesting activity to begin with, but it apparently can also get you sick. The third picture, well, it speaks for itself. Maybe mowing lawn is not very uh, good activity as well. Maybe this person is also too tired, but in both ways it's not very good to stay on the grass like that. <laughs> so please don't do it, use a towel. <laughs> All right, so. Now maybe you could raise a card if you have one of what disease you think might this represent. Yes, all right. Oh, that's perfect, that's great. Okay, you are absolutely correct. This is Francisella tularensis, or tularemia disease. And as I said, I promised you I would tell you, well, it is cured by the simple disinfectant called alcohol. And we can see it almost everywhere in this uh, place. So this is great to see from the organizational part as well. Uh, and also, of course, you have to cook the meat thoroughly and as well as just use the water that is chlorinated because unchlorinated water is still activating the bacteria. All right, now we can see that, sorry, okay. The people from the previous three pictures are now happy and smiling, so now they're educated on the matter, and even the not so interesting activities are at least not dangerous, so that's a good thing. <laughs> now let's go to disease number two. This is a virus this time, and of course, like many viruses, it leaves a lot of clues. So let's take a look at what it might look like with humans. This is a patient from Germany, but it is also all over the world. I'm just having it now as a Beispiel. <laughs> 
And uh, we can see that there is this very nasty lesion on the forehead that is also painful and itchy. Now let's take a look at what it looks like in animals. We can see the absolutely same clinical signs and also on three patients, it's not one cat. <laughs> and this is actually for me quite interesting. I, I suppose there is like a very big similarity between animal patients and human patients in this kind. So let's rewind. The, this is a virus infection, not like the bacteria one before. And also, the thing is that before that, it's not, it wasn't really a bad guy. It was actually a good guy. Why so? Well, it had a very big role in making the first ever vaccine for smallpox in humans by Edward Jenner. So, do you have any card in mind for this one? If you have just... Yes, correct. Very well. Um, I can see that everyone is agreeing on this. It is cowpox virus, and this is a member of the orthopox genus, which is also including the smallpox virus. So this was very helpful for the humanity before because it was really dangerous disease. Now we have the vaccine. So the third one that I'm talking about is again very widely spread, and it is all over the world with humans, with animals again, even in Bulgaria, where I'm from, and even in my university, where is the picture from? then you're going to ask me, OK, now what about this one? Well, this, as I said again, is a bacterial disease, but it also be, uh, is very dangerous for people working in the agriculture, like farmers and farm workers again, because it is also transmitted through their animals and through their milk products or their feces, urine, everything that's producted by animals, basically. So what a better place to do uh, the research than the veterinary medicine faculty, because the students are not very educated still. They are a little bit lacking experience. And at the same time, they always want to go where the animals are. So we did the research there. Now, how exactly was the transmission? We can see that it, can, it is actually possible to go also from the wild animals back again to the humans, from our domestic animals as well. Cats and dogs always are an option the milk products, and also actually through vectors. Now, there is also a bad story to it. It can also be used for bioterrorisms, like all of those kind of zoonotic diseases. So this is a very important thing to think about and to pay attention to those diseases that can be transmitted in agriculture. Now, do you have anything in mind for that one? Correct. That's perfect. Maybe the cards are too easy, right? <laughs> OK, so that is indeed Coxiella bornetti, or also called Q fever. It is called Q fever because back in the days, people weren't sure exactly how it worked like. So they were like, question mark, Q what? So it is a Q fever. Now, these three diseases actually aim to uh, notice this similarity between humans and animals and also the important factor of the environment around us. So this is exactly what the concept of One Health is all about. We need to show this interconnectedness. We need to think about how those animals can be useful for us and beneficial for us and our partners for life. But at the same time, we need to think about the actual dangers that they pose and how to properly deal with them so that we don't really um, always call the veterinarians to come and help us out, and we need to do the prophylactic treatments properly. So, again, thank you so much for everything, and um, thank you so much, dear Watson, for being part of this, as well as I would like to thank for the team that supported me and paid the cards around. <laughs> this was also great. And vielen Dank für die Aufmerksamkeit. <laughs> All right, thank you very much, Ivana. <laughs> thank you. Thanks. Thank you. You survived. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's good. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> All right. And last but not least, we've come to our final slammer of the day. So I'd like to welcome to the stage Jorge Guadalupe. <laughs> Barbecue from a bioreactor. Uh, so is this actually your first time in Germany? Yes. First time in Europe, actually. First time in Europe. Yes. How, how's it, where have you been? You've been here for like two weeks now. Well, it's been cold for a Brazilian, but um, I've been to Paris, I've been to Amsterdam to visit the Van Gogh Museum, and then here I am in Berlin to do some slam. <laughs> then I have to ask you the same question. What's your favorite city? It's Berlin. And honestly, honestly, it is Berlin. I liked it. I liked it very much. And actually, you tried to come to Berlin uh, in 2020. <laughs> Yes, so I, I had everything scheduled during my undergrad studies to come to University of Potsdam. Uh, I had until my Deutsch gelernt, uh, but came the pandemic, so I couldn't come. Uh, and then I changed my plans, and then I started working with this new field that I'm going to talk to you a little bit about, 
And here I am in Germany again, not to study, but to teach a little bit. <laughs> so then I have to ask you, what's your favorite German word? Glubiene. Glubiene. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm hungry. No, I don't know. <laughs> um, and actually, I, I looked at, your, uh, at the, the program about which you're, you're talking about cultivated meat. I would think <laughs> all meat cultivated, what is meat, cultivated <laughs> meat? So, okay, so cultivated meat is a name that, uh, uh, for this new technology that has been going on for now 10 years. The first ever cultivated hamburger was made by, in the Netherlands by Dr. Mark Post. And he made a hamburger of bovine satellite cells. So basically it's a hamburger made by cultivating the cells. We know how to, to cultivate cells, so how not cultivating <clears throat> Sorry. So how, uh, how not cultivate the cells in order to make a tissue, skeletal muscle tissue? This is a thing. So you're making the meat without the animal? Exactly. Without, this, without slaughtering the animal. Okay. All right. Well, I'm intrigued. Said, are you ready? <laughs> All right. Then let's uh, 10 minutes. Have fun. Okay. Thank you. All right. So everyone, uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how to make meat cultivating the cells. The title of my slam is Barbecue from a Bioreactor, a Steak That Never Made Moo. But before delving into that, I have to talk to you about that this is a very interesting event, the, the Grüne Woche. And I don't know if you know this, there are many speeches going on, there are many fairs going on, but there is one fair going on here that I'd like to call your attention to, which is the Cattle Beauty Pageant. So uh, we're going, there is a, 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 a jury that will elect the new and the most beautiful cow here at the uh, Grüne Woche. In case that sounds a little bit unfamiliar, it has happened before. Uh, this is a cattle beauty pageant that happened in Switzerland some years ago, and it's happening here at the Grüne Woche. So it started the first time in 2022, and who won was Frau Roberta, this beautiful cow, and she won, it's actually on her certificate. She won because of her unequaled ability to apply rouge, even though she, she, she doesn't have a thumb in her paw. Yes, it's written there. The next year, uh, there was a couple of sisters called Joselita and Frida Mendes. They're from Spain, and they won. It's actually written on their certificate, their unequaled ability to bring their culture, heritage to the stage. Look at that beautiful fringe. This year, things are a little messy. You're going to know who won in the next minutes, but there is some candidates. There is Oisin Thor. He's a, he's a very uh, 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 handsome ox, bringing size of all of the cows in the room, as you can see. Um, and he's here with his beautiful fringe, his beautiful hair, very, very nice. There is also a local friend of mine. She is Madalena Gezerá. She's from Brazil. And she's bringing here this powerful statement as about motherhood. As you can see, she's bringing the cow, and she has a lot of milk to feed it. There is also a very rich cow from Siberia. Her name is Katarina Popov. She's bringing her all of this exquisiteness to the stage as well. Look at the beautiful lipstick. But wait, can you hear it? There is a, besides the letter, there is also a bus going out. There is a new contestant. Her name is Lady Bai, with her beautiful royal hat, with her interesting revenge necklace from British. And everybody was like, what, Lady Bai? Lady Bai, a machine? Lady, Lady Baiana? What? What's that? What's that? And she, with a very toned and nuanced accent, explained, Lady Bioreactor. <laughs> what? what? What is a bioreactor? Sorry, a machine? What, what's, what's that? Excuse me? And she explained with her British accent again. So, bioreactors are tanks that have been designed to provide an effective, effective environment for living entities to transform biochemicals into products. Sorry? Pardon? She didn't understand. They didn't understand anything. So just like you have a bioreactor for a beer tank, a beer tank is a bioreactor where you put yeasts, the yeast will grow and make a bioproduct called beer. Just like that, I am a bioreactor, but instead of putting yeasts, you put muscle cells. They grow, and then you make a skeletal muscle tissue, which is meat. So just like you are fed with pasture, and your metabolism will create a skeletal muscle within, that we called after that meat. I am fed with appropriate nutrients, and within my metabolism and my culture media inside of me, I will make a meat, cultivated meat. And in case you're wondering, this is an actual cultivated meat made by this process by this Israeli company that just got their approval this year. This week, actually, this week. The cows were panicking. Okay, so in order to do that, I will ask Lady Bai to step out, and I'm bringing some scientists to explain a little bit of the thing, so just wait a few seconds. Okay, better, all right. So, 
Cultivated meat bioprocess, it means that we want to make a meat which is a skeletal muscle tissue. For that, we have to use cell culture techniques. It's not difficult, I promise. So basically, we, do, we, we extract pro proliferating cells from the animal that we want. It can be pork, it can be beef, it can be chicken. Uh, we make this initial culture, and then in order to make this scaled up, we put it on a bioreactor. This is where Lady Bi steps in. So after this bioreactor, the cells will proliferate, 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 proliferate. We'll have a huge amount of cells, but unstructured. It's th those are just a mass of cells. In order to them look like meat, we have to structure them. So we use this biomaterial called scaffold. And this is where the magic happens. And this is where Lady Bi steps out and comes Jorge, because I worked in my research with uh, scaffolding. So scaffolds for cultivate, it's actually a construction scaffold. So it's a three-dimensional biomaterial where the cells, instead of growing one the side of the other in a two-dimensional matter, they're going to grow in a three-dimensional matter. This is what we have. And in order to find one for cultivated meat is a tricky uh, uh, task because it has to be biocompatible, it has to be edible because we want to eat that, and it has to be affordable. We're talking about feeding millions, billions of people. So this is where, uh, uh, in my university, the UFMG University Federal de Minas Gerais, uh, together with GFI, which is uh, uh, the Good Food Institute, is an uh, uh, international organization that puts money in alternative proteins, published this paper. If you are curious, you just can scan that QR code. That we made up this uh, uh, investigation on cellulose acetate fibers. that it looks just like this. It's a paper. It looks like a paper. It's cellulose acetate derived from cellulose. If you zoom them out, you see this structure. Those French fries are actually just to show it's a microscopy to show the random mesh of it. So what we want is to put cells in it. Here's how they look. These are cells, uh, muscle cells cultivated onto the scaffold. So to show that this scaffold is good, we have to show that it's uh, 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 biocompatible. So here, every green cell is a cell that is alive, and every red dot is a cell that is dead. So it was very viable. The cells were very aligned. So this is the structure that we want. Look at this microscopy as well. We, we want the texture to happen. So with this technology, we created the first ever cultivated chicken in Brazil that you can scan in this QR code. It's the same paper to see if you are uh, curious about. And this is not a reality just in Brazil. This is a reality worldwide. So the, uh, the, admit, the agency for food in Brazil has already given green lights for companies to, put, uh, to set up uh, their uh, uh, products if they want to commercialize and be available for the consumers. For the consumers. <clears throat> The FDA has actually, last year, approved two companies from California to approve this, to, to eat these two chicken nuggets. And this chicken nuggets has been, ever, uh, has been commercialized in Singapore since 2020, the first ever country to commercialize. You can go to Singapore and eat this in a restaurant. So the cows were like, so no death of cows? Does it mean no deforestation to make new pastures? No carbon emissions from herd of us? So I'm going to step out again and bring my toned, nuanced British accent with Lady Bai. She said, yes. In less than 30 years, we're going to be 10 billion people. And there is nowhere else to put cattle to make pastures or to put soy or corn to make food for, for, the, for this cattle. And we have to feed this growing population with nutritional value, protein value. This is where it comes. And the cows were blasted. They were so happy. This one even joked when she found out she could, kept her, she could keep her plans to retire in Ipanema Beach for the rest of her life in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, so we, after this, actually, there was a, a very cool sound here of a drums beating. I could ask you to beat it with either your hands or... Thank you very much. With this in mind, there could be no other response. The Lady by being crowned as the Miss Cow Universe 2024 for her distinguished solutions on developing a cutting edge technology to create a more sustainable food production system. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matt Shoshi. Thank you. All right, you guys, those were our four slammers. And uh, before I explain to you how you guys are going to pick the winners, I'd first like to welcome our slammers all back on the stage in the order they appeared. Atika Saleh with the Eat Your City. Then we had Christopher Okolo with the Battle of the Bugs. Come on out. Ivana Gaidarova with How to Harvest Health. And finally, of course, Jorge Guadalupe with Barbecue from a Bioreactor. Those were our four contestants. Thank you. And now, 
Just do a brief summary so we remember what they all talk about. First, I forgot to ask you what your favorite German word is. You can use my mic. Doch. Doch. <laughs> Doch. Doch. That's a good. That's a good German word. Okay. So yeah. First, we had Attica, who uh, would like us to feed, uh, to use our roofs to feed ourselves, and she's discovering, however, that while vertical farming is a very viable, interesting product, it's uh, on the decline at the moment, unfortunately. And her favorite German word is Doch, which is very fitting. Uh, next, we had Christopher Okolo, who with the Battle of the Bugs, and I believe you offered to give us all nematodes to battle our enemies if we like to have them. Seemed like you made an offer there. Are yeah. nematodes good for? Yeah, very good. Okay. And of course, your favorite German word is Schmetterling. 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 <laughs> very good. Then we had Ivana with How to Harvest Health. She made you all into detectives to find, to find the cause of some gross-looking diseases that are caused by living too close together with everything. And, uh, of course, your favorite German word is quasi, which I think that's it. <laughs> yeah, I like that very much. Uh, then, finally, Jorge Guadalupe, where we had the Cow Beauty cont Contest, and Lady Bai was crowned the winner. <laughs> And uh, you made just a tiny piece of meat in all of your research. Okay. Those are our four contestants. We have one more applause for the slammers today. <laughs> and of course, Glubiene. Glubiene is your favorite German word. Glub Sorry? Glubiene is your favorite German Glubiene, word. Glubiene, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks a lot, guys. You can take your seat. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so now we come to your role in this whole thing. It's not just Said who gets to participate in the slam, it's you guys get to participate. And uh, the voting, we're going to do it online. We're using online, so if you could get your smartphones out and your data plans. If you scan uh, this QR code, you will come to the uh, page where you can pick a winner. All four, uh, they're all four listed there. The four slammers today are listed there, and you can choose your favorite. Uh, if you don't want to use the QR code, there is a uh, link down here in the bottom that you can give in, that you can just type in yourself. You don't need to include everything after the, the question mark there. But so there's, you can do that voting. So while you're voting, I think we'll take a three or four minute break to allow you to vote. And then uh, we will have a guest of honor come out and present the winner. And I'm really looking forward to it. So I'll see you back here in a couple minutes. <laughs> okay, everybody, we have a winner. So take your seats again. Yeah. Are you excited? Yeah. Okay, well, uh, then without further ado, it's my honor for the second year in a row to welcome, uh, to announce the winner, the German Minister for Food and Agriculture, Jem Oestemia. Hi. Dear ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for attending this year's GFFA Science Slam and for giving that round of applause to the four slammers now, please. <laughs> An applause, I think you all agree, that is well deserved. And a big thank you, Mr. Portnoy, for once again being the perfect host of this event. A big round of applause for our great moderator. And my special thanks go to the German Federal Institute for Risk Assessment for once again providing substantial support and extensive expertise to help us organize this slam. Thank you. <laughs> Dear slammers, thank you for opening up new horizons for us and for the entire agri-food sector. You have come here from different countries, from different continents. In my view, this stands in a way symbolic of what the GF GFFA is all about. Coming together from all over the world, sharing your experience, building bridges for a better future. Louis Pasteur once said, I quote, science knows no country because knowledge belongs to humanity and it is the torch which illuminates the world. No matter who's pronounced the winner of this context in a few minutes, I think you all are in the torches that Louis Pasteur had probably in mind. Thank you for sharing your passion for science with us. Ladies and gentlemen, according to the Association for the German Language, the political buzzword of the year 2023 
is the German word Krisenmodus, which can be translated as crisis modus in English. I think that this term gives us a very good idea of what last year was about. It is true that 2023, like in the years before, the world has shattered by numerous wars, conflicts and crises. I think of the Ukraine, I think of Israel and Gaza, I think of the floods, the droughts, the earthquakes in many parts of the globe. And I'm sure that no one would deny that our world was and still is in a permanent crisis mode. Participants, slammers, with your presentations today, you have clearly shown that there are ways and means to solve the current crisis if only we start acting now and acting together. That there are ways and means to reshape our agri-food systems and make them more sustainable than they are today. Ways and means to feed a growing world population while at the same time protecting our climates, halting biodiversity loss and conserving our national resources for the generations to come. You, as young and down-to-earth scientists, are a source of both, of inspiration and motivation, and expressly not only for experts, but for a wider public, for virtually everybody. You have looked the current crisis right in the eye and have seen it as a chance. You have drawn vital lessons from it, and you have masterfully shared these lessons with us, brought them home to us in your slams. You have made us curious about your subjects, about vertical farms, zero reach farming, and about being prosumers instead of just consumers, about heroic bugs that defeat insect pests, about controlling underestimated animal diseases, and about cultivated meat from a bioreactor. And one of you, however, has made the audience especially curious. And therefore, I don't want to keep you waiting any longer. So here is the result of our audience's votes. The winner of the 2024 GFFA Science Slam is George Guadalupe. Congratulations. Come here. Thank you, Mr. Hello. Thank Congratulations. You. Thank you. George Guadalupe from the Federal University of Mi Minas Gerais in Brazil with the slam on BB BBQ from a bioreactor. Congratulations. Thank you. I'm sure that we will hear a lot more in the future about what you're working on. And of course, this also applies for all the other slammers. Thank you very much for having graced our stage today. And I would like to congratulate you and hand you over this. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Thank you. Oh. Let's move here so we have a nicer picture. All the best and good sir. luck. Thank you. Okay, uh, this is quite stressful actually. Um, <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Um, it's been a pleasure to work with this. I mean, I think I'm very lucky to work with something where uh, my personal uh, beliefs and also my professional beliefs come together. So I really think that uh, we need some change in our, uh, um, in our food production system. I really think that climate change is no hoax. So it's happening, and I'm really uh, thankful because I applied for this with this barbecue from a bioreactor to the BMEL, and I was accepted with this. So thank you for the ministry for uh, uh, accepting me, uh, uh, accepting to my, 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 um, my want to talk a little bit, to share my knowledge with you. Uh, I'd like to thank all of the organizations as well. Uh, I'd like to thank a special thanks for Greg 
uh, in case you, uh, I, have to, I have to honor you. Uh, <laughs> the pageant idea was all his, so like I just added some of my, my, my creativity, but the core was his, so thank you very much. I would also uh, like to thank, it was such a, <laughs> it was such a pleasure to share the room, uh, the Italian restaurant yesterday, uh, and this uh, 48 hours with my other uh, contestants as well. Uh, we're almost family, we're, <laughs> we're helping each other, we're laughing with each other. Uh, thank you very much for also for this opportunity to knowing uh, these people. Thank you. It sounds like... It sounds like I've missed something yesterday evening, <laughs> fortunately. Let's go to get tonight again. <laughs> to be honest, I'd love to <laughs> skip my program and follow you guys. <laughs> All the best. And Thank I'm you. curious to read more about it. I will follow the science page of the newspapers to Thank read you. more about you in the future. Thank Good you. luck. Thank you very Thank much. You. Please, I would like to have the other three participants and winners here on stage to hand over the certificates. Let me start with the certificates, the 16th Global Forum for Food and Agriculture, GFFA Science Slam. This is to certify that Atika Ferus Saleh successfully took part in the 2024 GFFA Science Slam by presenting a current research topic in a clear and entertaining manner. Congratulations on the great performance. Come here, let's take the picture. Thank you. All the best, thank you. The next certificates goes to Christopher Tobe Okolo. You as well successfully took part in the 2024 GFFA Science Slam by presenting a current research topic in a clear and entertaining manner. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you very All much. the best. And last but not least, this certificate goes to Ivana Antonia Gajdorova. You as well successfully participated in the Science Slam. Congratulations on your great performance. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. All the best. Thank you very much. Should we have a final picture together? Please come. I use this as my certificate. <laughs> I never won a certificate. <laughs> but I have the honor to be next to those great winners here. Okay, um, that's the end of our slam, you guys. I hope you had a good time. Uh, I would personally just like to thank uh, the Ministry for uh, Risk Assessment for organizing the slam for us. My name is Drew Portnoy. We're from Polycult. We do slams all over Berlin. Thanks a lot. I hope you had a good time. Have a good day. See you later. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Good.